right. Welcome back to the Board Drill Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kyle. Here are my co-host, Matt. Tonight, we have another strength and conditioning episode we're really excited about. We have uh, Cody Hughes, who is the assistant athletic director and head strength coach at Madison Academy. He's also a salt, uh, consultant, a resource provider on clhstrength.com. If you go there, you can look at his uh, 2022 football program. He's got a bunch of manuals. And he even has, and he can talk a little more about this, but an online mentorship where he works with coaches over a 10-week kind of program to help educate them on strength and conditioning. If you're not one of those certified, I don't know what all the letters are, right? It's like CSS, SC, Niner, 85. If you're not one of those guys that has one of those advanced degrees, um, so check it out. Coach, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kyle. Matt, I really appreciate it. <laughs> so um, if you're listening in, uh, this is that time of year. Uh, a lot of teams are coming out of spring. We want to do a couple strength and conditioning episodes. And uh, like I always say, me and Matt found guys a lot smarter than us in strength and, strength and conditioning to talk about it tonight. So before we get into the episode, like we always say, if you could smash that like button, hit the subscribe the more subscriptions and the more likes we get, uh, the better we are for getting guests and everything else to help you coaches out. So if you could do that for me, that'd be great. All right, coach, let's get into it. All right, we're leaving spring right now. Um, a couple of my buddies are actually playing their spring game tonight. We're going to get into this eight-week section in summer that's so vital for high school football programs. All right, we've talked about some off-the-field stuff, some, on, you know, some, I always say off the field. We've talked about some weight room stuff, some on-the-field things. Um, what are the first things we need to be cognizant about? I saw you tweet about this the other day, and I'm actually just going to go right and ask you a question about it. You said week one, don't kill them. And obviously, I kind of know what you mean about that, but can you talk a little more in depth about what you mean specifically in week one? Absolutely. Um, I think that the number one goal for high school coaches is to go into their week one or go into their jamboree or however it is in whatever state that you're in, to go into it healthy. That's number one. Okay. But at the same time, you want to prepare your athletes to be on edge. You want them to be tough. You also want them to be prepared going in, going into their season. But there's a common trend I see around the country, especially in the high school that I think is borderline a plague that coaches get so fired up coming out of spring ball. You get that, that you know, you get that break right at graduation, that small break around Memorial day. And then you're about to fire up the summer. And you think you have to set this tone, right? You think that we're here, right? Baseball season's over. It's football season, baby. <laughs> here we are. And the whole coaching staff is just like, ah, oh, just fired up, you know, excited. And I don't think they necessarily mean it in a harmful way, but they don't understand physiology and they don't understand the body. So week one, you're thinking, oh, man, like we're going to get out there and set the tone. And they're not aware of how much high-speed yardage they're running, how much time they're spending on their feet, and how much soreness is going to happen week one anyway because of a change. A little education for you. Soreness happens for two reasons. Number one, it's a larger stimulus than the body has is recognized recently. Or two, it's something, a new stimulus they haven't received before. So if they're just coming out of spring ball, right, and they've been in – kind of like practice mode, but it's kind of every other day, you know, you just played a game, but then you had about 10 days off or so, you know, it could be a little more than that, maybe 14 days if you stretch it. And then you come back on that first day and it goes back into, cause usually in spring ball, the weight room usually lightens up a little bit because the field is a little bit more. And it depends on what state you're in. I don't know how much football you're doing in the summer with the weight room, but it's usually both plus seven on seven. There's a lot of events that are happening first. So if that first week, you bury them with a lot of volume in the weight room for the sake of toughness, which is a whole nother conversation. And then on the field, you guys are running all over the place. You're expecting high energy. You're expecting your team to be fired up. But the, the amount of energy and fatigue that's going to onset after one week is going to cause some serious onset and some serious delayed like fatigue where it's going to lower the quality of all of your training, all of your skill work, all of your practice probably up to the next two or three weeks. Wow. And then you're going to be playing catch up. And if you're playing catch up, now you're trying to draw things back, which is actually counterintuitive. And then if your kids are both central and peripherally fatigued, the weight room quality is going to drop in week two. You're already going to see injuries start to happen. You may see hip flexors, groins, hamstrings, um, 
and all of that start to get sore and, and knickknack. And then all of a sudden you're questioning your team's toughness. Oh, you're not ready for this. You're not in shape. Oh, let's run them more. Oh, let's get hurt more. <laughs> and now it's this vicious cycle. And you look up and you've gotten to July 4th and what have you gotten done? Rather than starting something with something you know that your kids can handle, they can fly around the field. They can fly around the weight room and they leave that first week with some left in the tank, but they're begging for more. So like, why isn't coach letting us do more? That's it. But they're fired up to come back week two, and then you build on it just a little bit more. And then I think in June, it should be all about accumulation, right? You need to accumulate capacity for work, both on the field and in the weight room. And how you do that, to me, I think the, the best place to start is whatever you think is good for week one, cut that in half. Now, <laughs> but now, and that also causes you as a coach to think critically about what is actually most important to you. Because yeah. how much do coaches just fill time with with, with fluff? Just to say yeah. we worked hard and we, we practiced for three hours. But if you put a time limiter on it, okay, what's the most important thing we need to work on right now coming out of spring ball, right? Coming out of spring ball, do we get our baseball and trap guys back, right? What is our roster looking like? You know, in the weight room, and to me, the weight room is extremely simple, right? Just keep the reps really low. And don't, don't bury, don't bury them with a lot of reps and a lot of heavy weight on, don't, 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 don't back squat max everybody on day one. Please God, don't do that. <laughs> um, you know, and you don't need to do that in order to set training numbers. If you actually had a decent off season, because to me, summer's not off season, summer's preseason, like in my opinion, like it is, yeah. it is not off season. It's too late to try to de deliver some huge off season program. Once you get, once you're eight weeks out from camp, right. Um, it should be more preseason, you know, cause you've got so much football involved now, but that, that's my whole take is that if you, if you start light and then just add a little bit more time, a little bit more reps, a little bit more intensity, by the time you hit July 4th, you've actually made strides, your kids are healthy. And then when you get to July, it's like, okay, like we're, we're ready to practice even harder now, right? We're healthy. Our kids are happy. And we can really turn this thing up. And that, that's when you can really turn it on. And you can turn it on because you're ready to turn it on. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with doing really high intense work as long as you're prepared for it. Like the literal definition of injury is applied force is greater than tissue tolerance. It's that simple. Okay. And if, if you apply a lot of force that that tissue is not tolerant for and it hasn't experienced in a while, it's going to be damaged. Therefore, soreness, injury likelihood goes up. And that's... That's I know that's kind of abstract to understand from like a, a practice planning, you know, because that's mostly what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. sure, you could absolutely bury a kid in weight room with a ton of volume, ton of eccentric stress. If you have no idea how to program a strength conditioning, you know, if you don't know how to write a program and understand what volume even is, because a lot of coaches don't know. They just they, most of the time they carbon copy a program from some legendary coach or legendary school that won state championships. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty <laughs> stupid. You're right. I mean, you know, they wouldn't carbon copy their playbook, but they sure will their strength program. Like, let's let's make it make sense. Um, but that's that's where you can really you can debilitate kids in the weight room like that. But also, like my value to my head coach is not just the weight room; it's helping him understand how to play in practice, just from a physiological standpoint, not, and and not necessarily a skill standpoint. Like, I'm I'm very fortunate at my school. I'm the assistant AD. Um, but I'm the head strength coach, was a strength coach in college. That's what I did. I never coached football, um, but I'm obsessed with football. But I have an assistant strength coach who's also certified, who coaches on staff, who is yeah. basically an extension of me. And we can have intelligent conversations with our head coach, and he's willing to listen to us about like, hey, just something as simple as temperature, time on feet, drill selection that comes along with how much running we're doing, how much contact we're having, and just keeping a pulse on the health of our kids. And then knowing when seven on sevens are coming up, OTAs are coming up or whatever we have, just keeping a pulse to know when we can push, push the gun and when we can pull back. Cause that's, that's all we try to do. Cause if we don't walk into that jamboree week one, healthy and fired up, ready to go. Cause like last year we played four state championship and we played 15 games. Okay. We played five more games than most, than everybody yeah. else, you know, than people that didn't make the playoff, we played five more games, play a half more of a season. We want to be real. I want to be great in November. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm dragging because that's what that fatigue will accumulate throughout the year too. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself because we're, we're talking about going into summer, no, that's right. but that, that is the accumulating thing that happens and all this volume, you get all so excited. And then by the time you want to make a playoff run, your guys are burnt. Their tank is done. 
I mean, you guys already know if to make a playoff run in the first place, to go deep in the playoffs takes a lot of fortitude and grit because it's a long freaking year going from June 3rd to December 4th to play yep. a state championship game. And I saw it mm-hmm. in my guys last year, you know, like that we all wanted to be there, but we were like, Whoa, we're fighting. We want it so bad, but dude, we're beat up. And that's just the nature of the sport. If it's already got a nature of attrition that it takes to get where you want to end up getting anyway, which is a championship, why would you spend all those bullets early? And then on the micro in the summer, same concept. Don't spend all your bullets early for some vanity sake that you're just making up. Right? This is our culture. This is our standard. This is how we do things. We, we're hard. We're tough. You're injured and you're getting beat. You suck. Like, <laughs> that's what I say. Like, and your yep. kids hate you. You, your kids can't stand to come to practice, but you're like, well, it's hard to play for me because I'm a tough coach. All right, buddy. You know, that's how I feel. Yeah, no, a lot of that makes sense. Um, and, and I think the piece of it is you really made a good correlation there. When we install things during the summer, right, we don't over install on week one, right? I don't put the whole defense in. Matt, I know you don't put the whole offense in. Why do that in the weight room? And, you know, I've never thought about that before until you just said it, it kind of clicked in my head. And then I feel kind of dumb, Matt. Did you ever know the exact definition of injury? I didn't. I didn't either. No, that I was, and, I, and that, that's fascinating. that connected well with me. And, uh, man, you think of it differently <laughs> when you hear that. Yeah, I was like, oh, my God, yep. there's a definition of injury. <laughs> it's just a mechanism, right? I mean, like contact. Think about getting in a car wreck. The applied force from a car wreck is so great it it breaks our system therefore there's injury when you have a hard hitting football certain leverages right you can you can leverage a certain thing for things to not happen and we lift weights to try to make that likelihood harder and harder and harder yeah so uh, given that 8 week period you know obviously we don't want to go too hard early on which i completely understand a is there anything now that that coaches are doing a lot of that we need to stay away from any movement in the weight room. And then B I'm going to follow it up with do our, should we max more than a couple times that, you know, cause that's always the big thing, right? Kids want to know more max and other coaches do. I could give a shit less at this point in my career about maxing, but other people do. So I'm going to kind of to make that part two question. Like, is there anything that you would just steer away from? And you can say, like, look, if you're not an expert, steer away from this. I know I'm putting you on the spot here. That's why I'm giving you a little bit of time. And then be like that maxing thing. Should it happen multiple times? Should it happen once or twice during the summer? Kind of how does that go over eight weeks? That, I mean, I could talk for an hour and a half on that. <laughs> but all right, let's start with one. Yeah. Movements you should stay away from. You know, there's there's movements or exercise selection, and then there's how much you're doing. Okay. Yeah, I don't think movement is necessarily the problem because, like, if you ask my opinion, that's my philo- my philosophy is different. I will tell you, I think that the power clean is the biggest waste of time and of all time. I will absolutely piss a lot of people off when I say that. <laughs> like, the power clean may be the biggest waste of time in high school strength conditioning. Why is that? That's just return on movement? investment is okay. extremely low. Okay, that is not me saying the cl- the power clean has not been effective because obviously it's been around for a very long time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But to me, the return on investment of the power clean, for example, do you even know what the word power means in power clean? Like what it, what it's referring to? Not going all the way down. I have no idea. That's right. You're right. You're actually right. Okay. A lot of coaches (laughs) think power clean means it's the most powerful exercise that exists. You know, it's power. So we do power cleans. No power is the position in which you receive the bar. It's an Olympic lifting mm-hmm. term yeah. for this sport of Olympic lifting. Okay. But anyway, the whole point is there's so many moving parts to that. Like, for example, I would rather get my, I'd rather get my kids strong and fast and powerful with the, in the fastest way possible with the most effective way possible. Like if you actually pick apart to clean the pieces of it that are supposed to be effective, you got to be skillful in all of it and then have a stimulus strong enough to get from it. Like, my biggest eye-opening example was now I have tech, right? I have a lot of tech in my weight room. I'm, I'm a yeah. big tech nerd. A lot of, like a lot of people don't have budgets. That? I do. I'm, so, I'm, okay. I'm VBT awesome. or die, like period. I, I love it, Coach. I we Me and Coach Avery, who's coaching right now, polls in a game tonight. Uh, we talked about if we could buy VBT, all these things we do. And we went to the point of even learning all about it and then 
we never had enough money to buy it. So we were like, well, this was a waste of hours of our life. Well, I'll throw out terms too. Like, like I have, I have VBT and it's not that expensive. Like I, I, I don't really love the excuse of like, it's too expensive whenever you're, you're paying $5,000 for free huddle. Like it's yeah, not no, about money. I, it's about, it's about value. Correct. Right. You have to have huddle in order to prepare your team to watch film with speed and break it down. Yeah. You saw the value. So you're not going to, you're not even going to blank. If, if huddles like if huddle, if there was no other option and huddle cranked their price to eight grand a year, all of you would find it. Every one of you would find it. Yeah. Guarantee it. So like, that's not an excuse to me. Right. But anyway, like, yeah. So I use VBT. So back to the power clean. I'm not saying that coaches don't, don't hang me. That's I, you can, if you want, I'm, I'm, I'm totally welcome to it. I love all the smoke by the way. But the biggest key is I saw a kid like our starting middle linebacker who's playing uh, – he's playing uh, NAIA ball. He's he's a beast. He could clean – like he was like 180 pounds, but the most he could ever clean was like 265 just because yeah. he wasn't – he just, just wasn't quite proficient. He was a good enough cleaner, but, but 180 pounds, clean 265 in high school, that's not bad. No. And then – but he could take a trap bar at 365 and move it at 1.0 meters per second and a peak power of over 3,000 watts. And I was like – Whoa. Okay. Cause to me, like, okay. So that, to me, that negates the whole power clean is powerful. There's yeah. more, there's other arguments for using the clean, such as like athleticism, coordination, contact prep. I mean, I'll, I think they're all BS, but I can, I could see you making that case and that's fine. You can do it all you want. I'm going to whip you whenever we play you just know that. <laughs> um, that's all I'm going to say. Right. Cause I'm going to spend the rest of my time sprinting, doing plyos and jumping and doing things I'm going to do on the field. Okay. So but that's as far as let's get back to the original question. As far as movements go, I don't care what you choose. Make sure that your movement selection or your movement menu is balanced for the most part. Okay. Make sure your your training movements well and make sure you can coach it. The most butchered exercise is obviously the squat. I mean the power cleans up there. I've seen some really bad ones. <laughs> really, 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 really bad ones. But the squat is what really gets everybody gets hung up on. You know, it's the king, right? Squat max day. Everybody loves it. But that post that you saw, right? I also made a post earlier about like evaluating leg strength um, yeah. not too long ago. That remember this. Remember where you place your value is where your kids are going to be attracted to. And if all you value for leg strength is max day, I'm putting all my eggs in my basket of whose maxes are higher. Those are the strong guys. That's who we need to win. The natural gradient, you're going to be literally magnetic to doing things in order to see your one rep max go up. Well, the easiest way to up your one rep max is to shorten your range of motion. <laughs> so you're yeah. going to find the kids are going to find that yeah. fine line. Coach, coach that counted, right? Yeah. I'm not going right. to go lower than I have to. If coach says I don't have to, cause I want to be up on that board. I want to please my coach. Yeah. Right. So, all right. Well, if that's the case, like is the, is the squat actually about trying to increase, you know, leg strength? Cause it's shown and proven that if you can use more range of motion, you're going to stimulate the whole muscle a whole lot more and gain strength by training it that way, rather than just showing me how good of a barbell lifter you are. Every single one of you guys have a guy in mind right now that was a freaking weight room warrior, but an absolute Bobby Benchman. Guard the water cooler, baby. Play on my scout team. <laughs> yeah. But boy, well, it was weight room one. time. I was the leader, dog. Like, I'm, I'm woo, woo, woo. But when it comes time to practice hard, like, where's he at? Like, he's not uh, any Matt, good. Matt, you can probably remember one per year because I definitely can, like a different kid almost every year that fit that bill right there. M multiple ones. Coach, <laughs> I want to go right back to what you said about power cleans because sure. I, I feel very strongly I, – I agree with you um, because I always felt like every year you're reteaching it and there's so much teaching of technique that was – just it felt like at some point it was time wasted with some of the kids that just couldn't do it. You know, they just mm -hmm. couldn't get the technique down and you can only spend so much time uh, working on that with the kids. And you'd see their maxes go up as their technique got better and then it would plateau off, you know, and you wouldn't see the gains as much once their technique got good. And you're going, well, their technique's good. Now their gain should be going. Well, all they were doing was increasing their maxes when they were learning the technique and then once they got the technique down, we didn't see huge gains. So I, I, I completely agree with you. And there's so much time just spent in the technique of it. And it's not done on the football field. Sure. And that's, that's what, if you look at it, the one thing we have finite is time. 
And if in order to get good at a clean, which is a technical lift, it's a complex lift, you need to do it almost every session, some form, hang clean, power clean, clean pull, hang clean pull, complexes, you know, front squat, all the things you got to do to be, even be good at it in the first place. And then when you like pull up a pie chart of the time spent in your weight room of what you're working on, all I ask is this, if you're spending more time on clean technique than sprinting, you are in the wrong ballpark, dog. Be 100%. If you're not doing plyometrics, if you're not timing sprinting, if you're not doing things to work on agility and change the direction, if you're not working on being explosive, there's way other ways to do that, in my opinion, without having to worry about that time consumption. That's what I mean by return on investment. Okay. Now, if you're just mm-hmm. hell bent on the power, and the thing is, if I ask a coach, like, why do you clean? They're going to say, because it's, it develops power. And I'm going to ask them to define that, and they can't do it, other than it looks cool. Right. Like it's fast. It's snappy. It's twitchy. I'm like, it's not even close to a regular vertical jump with 20 pound dumbbells in your hand. And the force is not even close to that. If you actually have a force plate, which I do, like I've actually seen the numbers. Like if you look at research and things of that nature. Right. So it's that's why I actually was a huge proponent of the clean. Did it for three years. And it actually took my intern to 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 ask me and, and provoke a question. And because I was already kind of leaning towards that anyway. He's like, let's just give it a shot. Give me let's do it for six weeks. We took it out completely. Jumps went up. Sprints went up. Nothing ha- – like if you – I ask you this. If you take cleans away from your program and don't even replace it with anything, do any metrics go down? Do, does anything – is anything affected? So why are you doing it? Because like to me, the argument for the squats is, is, is definitely there. Like if we don't get our legs strong, that's a problem. Like the so, squat is absolutely important. So for the coach that's listening that's like, okay, get rid of cleans – what do I replace it? But what, what else is going to, what am, uh, else can I benefit from? What else do I do in the weight room besides a clean? All right, let's talk about it. So to me, a clean, if you say it's powerful, the definition of power is force times velocity, right? If we understand math in a multiplication equation, both force and velocity have the same value, correct? Like yes. they, they hold the same value, All right, Force. I get my force from all my heavy lifting. Lift freaking heavy with great technique. Absolutely. Velocity, sprint, and jump. It's pretty simple because a clean is not heavy enough to be forceful and it's not fast enough to be considered velocity. So it's not really all that powerful. And to me, I'm a big fan of the loaded jumps, whether it's a barbell jump on your back or if it's a trap bar jump. That's not necessarily replacing the clean like because there's a receptor, there's an eccentric force to it. But heavy squats, plyometrics, sprinting, and loaded jumps 100% replace it times 10, in my opinion. And now I have tech that can measure all that stuff. Right. If I'm a football, if I'm a football coach in a weight room and I don't, the first, the number one thing I'm buying is timing gates. Yeah. Like get your kids to see your sprint times and compete with them and then do what Tony Holler says, record, rank and publish, create competition, create incentive to move fast. Cause there's no exercise more neurally driven and neurally powerful to unlock all power qualities than sprinting. And that's even for your big boys. That's even for your linemen. The, the the absolute most athletic linemen are going to be your fastest ones. Like yeah. if you – one of the best – a guy you guys need on your podcast, his name is Joe Stakowski. He's a special teams coordinator at Grayson High School in Georgia. He's a good friend of mine, but he's also like this crazy nerd, man. He was a track coach. He was a head coach at one point, uh, part of that powerhouse in Georgia. And he has a system of sprinting and what he calls uh, a metric called pounds per inch. So you measure a kid by how many – uh, how many pounds per inch they are tall, right? That's a big human, right? If, if your pounds per inch is over four, you're a big human, right? And you've got certain speeds at certain pounds per inch. He actually reverse engineered the uh, NFL combine for especially big boys, like pounds per inch and what you run and then longevity in the NFL. Tony Holler even says that the fastest 40 for the for O linemen in the NFL combine have the longest careers. It's the most athletic thing you could do. Yeah. It's the greatest mm-hmm. stimulus you can do. But lining up and doing sprinting takes time. If cleans are taking all my time and I'm not sprinting, that to me that that's a problem. So that's number sprints number one, hundred percent. Plyometrics, right? Jump far, jump high, jump quick, jump long. Like jump more, more often, jump consecutively. How quick can you get off the ground? How high can you jump? How far can you jump? Can you jump far consecutively? There's your plyo program right there. That's really simple. 
and then mark it, write it down, and compare it. Every single coach in America collects data. Every single one of them. Data is important. Why are there so many coaches in America in weight rooms that don't even touch it? They write something up on a whiteboard that they copied from some manual in the fourth quarter program from 2009 from Alabama, and they don't think about it. They just, and a lot of times they just keep it the same and scream and go. I'll even say this, and I won't say the school's name in Alabama, but it's a prominent, constant contender in Alabama, and their program in the weight room is Five four three two one power clean. Five four three two one bench press. Five four three two one back squat. All year round, no matter what. Can I guess? I, I no, would I'm say. Kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I would say that they are winning despite their weight room, and that's the hard part for coaches. Is that you can have a really crappy weight room with really good players and really good ball coaches yeah. and still win. Like I understand that the weight room doesn't necessarily win you games if you got the cats and the staff and the re and the and the money. You got cat staff and money, especially nutrition wise. You can you can you can field a staff to get individual game plan, the manpower, and you got really good players, you can get away with some really stupidity in the weight room. Yeah. But you can. And then you've got <laughs> you've got programs that need to develop. Right. Because I I heard one of my good friends, Ty Burton, who's an unbelievable strength coach in the state of Alabama as well. He presented at our state clinic this year and he said this, that you don't win, you don't win with your tank fine players. That's not how you win championships. You win with players six through six through 20. Your middle of the road guys are what makes the difference, you know, and how are you developing those guys? Yeah. I think it makes great points. So coach, let me go back. All right. Talked about, you know, loading weight, sprint and jump and all this stuff. So what's the layout a normal week? And I'm just going to give you a week that I was very familiar with. We worked out Monday through Thursday, game Friday mm-hmm. off because we always want to have three day weekend. That's also for coaches too, because that's just the way it is. I'm sure in a perfect world, it's a we Wednesday. Do the same. It's a Wednesday thing in a perfect world, but we all have lives and families. So, what would a and and I know it's going to be different for every program a little bit, but what is the ideal thing to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Do I jump every day? Do I sprint every day? You know, like how would I lay that out? Let's say I am coach X Y Z in Florida, and I have two other coaches on my staff and I have a weight room with decent equipment, you know, some platforms and stuff, but that's kind of it. And I got a field to go sprint on maybe a track. What's the, you know, in your opinion, what's the best thing I can be doing Monday through Thursday? Sure. So it's really, that question is also tough because of the context of is your weight room big enough to house your whole team? Yeah. Because it's not, yes. (laughs) <laughs> okay, I was going to say, because if you need to we'll, station we'll things off, things world, get yeah. different. Okay, so I can get, I got, world, I got 40 kids. Let's just say I'm mm-hmm. a smaller program. I'm the 2A program in Florida. I got 40 kids that can all fit my weight room at the same time. How would I do my money through Thursday? If, if I could do it your with your opinion mm-hmm. your way. So <clears throat> I think don't make rules. Don't make your own rules that you all of a sudden feel guilty if you break. Like, for example, a lot of coaches will go, all right, we're going to go upper, lower, upper, lower. Or lower, upper, lower, upper. Like to me, like now you're like, oh, it's supposed to be an upper day. Why are we doing legs on that? Like, no, it should be stimulus driven, in my opinion. To me, on a Monday, that should be a lower day. So think when I say stimulus, I think like think output and like think charged energy. Like you know, like the the the, the paddles in a hospital. You charge that thing up and boom. Like you think yeah. about explosiveness. That's like really high nervous system driven. Okay. Low nervous system driven means recoverable. Like if you're, if you, if you do something that's, that takes a lot of energy and output, you need to recover from it, right? On days that you don't, you can recover from it pretty fast. Usually upper body workout, you can recover from a lot faster than a lower total body workout, right? Or local, local joint, like single joint exercises, curls, tricep push downs, shoulder work, you know, core work, things of that nature. Um, so Mondays to me need to be low because I think the weekends are stressful for kids. I've been a strength coach at the high school level for six years now, going into my seventh year at the same school. My outputs have never been the highest on Monday. Everybody thinks the argument is they're the freshest on Monday. That's not true. They've been staying up all night. They've been eating chips. They've been on the game. They've been with their girlfriend. Like they're actually probably going to come in dragging and need to get the body going. So like Monday, I would make more of an upper body focus, but it doesn't mean it can't be lower body. Like for example, if an upper body focus and where we want to just lift that day, or we don't want to necessarily run fast. And it also depends on if you're also practicing back to back. Like to me, 
I would do change of direction work that day if you're going to do field work, right? Because that's not that taxing. As long as you don't drive them into the ground, right? As long as you no, it, it, the poison is in the dosage, right? Anything can be bad for you if you do too much of it, right? Yeah. One aspirin will heal you, a hundred will kill you. I mean, that's just that's that's the dosage. So change of direction is really not going to take a lot out of the nervous system, right? But you can work on a movement quality, right? Yeah. You can do something such as bench press that day, chin ups. Um, if you want to hit some lower body, maybe you hit some dumbbell work, you know, maybe some some glute bridges, maybe you do some lunges something that's hitting the body so it doesn't go away forever. Or you can just do a, a straight up upper body split, upper body work with change of direction, agility work, short distances, shuttles, things of that nature, um, you know, agility work, uh, reactive work. And then on Tuesday, turn that thing up, right? And make it into your high intense day. So maybe Monday looks more like an upper body day or mostly an accessory day, full body. And then Tuesday, you turn around and you start doing all your high high intensity work. So let's, let's sprint, right? If you're early in the summer, always work with sprinting, work short to long. Cause the last thing you want to do is line up and run a 40 because your hamstring contractions are, your hamstrings are not going to be, your tissues are not going to tolerate that force. Yeah. Going back to the injury, right? Cause hamstring speed contraction, you can't replicate anywhere else but sprinting. So you got to slowly build it in. Like to me, I'd start with 10 yard sprints. Now, if you have time and gates, you do a fly-in sprint. Coach, okay? I live and die on the flying 10. And, and I'll tell you why real quick. I don't want to interject too much. We did the flying 10s the last two years. We didn't have one injury ever sp- sprinting when we started the summer and started the, the whole cycle with flying 10s. And we, yep. we got bigger than that. But for some reason, I, I don't know what it is about that. I'm not smart enough between you and Tony Holler and all those guys. Here's what I know. We never got injured doing it. Yeah, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you why. So one, all right, let me, so everybody to understand when we say flying 10, like, what does that mean? All the definition of a fly run is, is that there's a, say there's two, there's two timing gates. So when you enter the timing gate, the, the clock starts. When you exit the second gate, the clock stops. So you get a 10 yard capture of a 10 yard sprint, but there's a buildup behind it. The reason why the fly 10 is so powerful because it's reliable as it gets. There's no human error. It's you cannot argue it, yeah. period. The other way to time a sprint is to get the start. That's what makes the NFL combine so controversial because, you know, it's a hand start and there's a margin of error of plus minus 0.08. So, like, you can't – it's not reliable. It's just not. But if you do a flying 10, there's no human error. You can repeat that all the time. Yeah. Now, as far as how long you run up to the gate, controls your distance we run five yard build into 10 yard fly all year long to me i call that the game speed fly now it's only a 15 yard sprint but you capture the last 10 yards and i've got over 10,000 data points on that one run alone and i can tell you what's fast and what's not okay but that's only 15 yards you're not going to get hurt there you're not going to get hurt you don't have enough time you stay in acceleration but you stay there for a week and then you back it up five yards maybe go into a 10 yard build it's going to get faster Right, you go to a twenty yard build, it's gonna get even faster. The the Tony Holler flying ten of the fastest you're gonna see is a thirty yard build, the last ten yards of a forty yard dash. Yep. That's the one where your hamstrings are gonna start kicking in and you wanna build to that. And then once you're there, you wanna do that. And guys, I'm talking two and three reps a week. That's all it takes. Yeah. That's all it takes. Line up and compete. Pay to find a way to fundraise for some timing gates, post the numbers in your locker room. And the kids will see and then turn around and do the momentum number for the big boys, the yeah. truck stick number, right? So it's the same concept, but you add in body mass. How fast can you move your body mass? You make it competitive for everybody. You try to see rolling averages to, for kids to improve, and you'll find yourself faster at the end of the year. And it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take many reps. Full recovery so you can go fast. It's another thing. I know a huge pet peeve of mine. Quit calling things sprints if you're not recovering. It's not a sprint anymore. It's a survival mechanism. It's it's jogging at that point. All uh, right. So let's <laughs> let me interject. What's a nor you know, and, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm asking you, what is a normal recovery time to a sprint if I do a flying ten? Okay, it's thirty seconds to a minute for every ten yards ran. Oh, that's, that's perfect, pretty simple. It's really easy math right there. And thirty seconds or on the end of shorter sprints, because I've seen I've seen cats run a fifteen like that five and a ten yard fly I was telling you about. So that fifteen yard sprint. Yeah. Right. So that would technically be 45 seconds rest if you do the math. Okay. Just to walk back, maximum rest. We're not jogging back. I'm not wasting energy. I'm only putting energy into into the output of the drill. Yeah. And turn around and run it again. And they've done like, I've seen guys, I literally, if you go to my Instagram, 
there's a video of my basketball player who swore they could run 17 miles an hour in this short sprint, which is elite for a high school kid. And this yeah, best he'd ever done is 16, four. Yeah. yeah. And he, he said, I can do it coach. I was like, there's no way it's like a whole story. He ends up doing like eight sprints with just a walk back and he ends up hitting it. And it, it's electric. Oh, wow. like it's, it's on my page. Like you should go see, but, uh, but that's with short sprints. Now, the further you get, you need to go more towards a minute, right? Cause if you run, if you run 40 yards, as hard as you can, you're going to, yeah. the system is going to need about four minutes to recharge. Yeah. And just, just chilling, like just need four minutes. That, and also because it takes so much out of your body, you don't mean you, you don't need many reps. Yeah. You don't need many, like two, two, two is adequate in my opinion. Yeah. Like if you're yeah, that's just it. for reference, I think, I think we ran three. Um, in, but the cool part, I guess the nice part about the timing is we had it set up perfect. We only had two gates, but we had plenty of the, like the GPS tags that go on. We had free lap, yeah. Yeah. but we had enough kids that were out there that literally they could run and get back in line. By the time they got to the front, they were, they were four minutes rested. So they were fully rested and then they could just run. So like we were just sitting there recording as every kid went through and it was perfect. And we told them like, you stay in the order that you're in. We'd have a guy call out the name. The kid would run. And we didn't even have to worry about rest because we knew it took four minutes for that kid to get back exactly. every, time, every time. Well, if you're smart, that's the thing is you build build rest into the mechanism and structure of your flow already. Yeah. It's the same concept, for example, on in the weight room and squatting. Like how you want to control your weight room is up to you. Like if you want to blow the whistle for every guy to go to keep flow, great. Uh, I, when I was a GA at division at a division two university, it was one guy, the way he did it was a whistle turnover to ensure that the guys like on a squat, usually on a squat, you don't get three minutes rest unless you're doing, if you're doing lighter power work, you can go more like two minutes, but three minutes rest is pretty, pretty typical. Yeah. And if you do a set of squats and you've got three guys in a rack, which is pretty what you want by the time that third guy, that, that top guy comes around to his second set. That's about right. About yeah. a minute, about a minute, a guy for changing weight, as long as they're not messing around. But coach would blow the whistle for the first set. Everybody would go through. And when the first guy was back up to the top for the second set, he had a watch and would kind of see what the timing was. And boom, here we go, second set. And so adequate rest for output is also important. That's one other. Here's another topic for the weight room. Coaches, why are you so concerned with standing around in the weight room when your guys stand around on the sideline for six minutes between drives? <laughs> Yeah. Now, if your answer to that is they get bored and they're going to they're going to freaking mess around and get distracted and and okay, I, I hear you. Okay? But don't don't think that making them busy, right? Or giving them a four different supersets to make them tired is going to diminish their squat quality or their the exercise or their power clean if you're doing that or their the the big exercise you're programming in the first place if you're taking them and making them tired to even do the one thing you wanted, that's like asking them, hey, we're going to go on an offensive drive. We're going to score. And hey, y'all going to do jumping jacks until we go out for the next drive. So we're going to start tired because we're tough. <laughs> that is weird. You would never do that. It doesn't make any freaking sense, no. right? Right? You're going to high school, right? Four to six plays per drive. That's the average, right? 10 to 12 drives per game. Am I wrong? I, it's probably somewhere in there, yeah. That's pretty close, right? Like, I, I, at one point, I had that number really dialed in. I watched, a, I literally broke down the last five years of our film and averaged all the numbers out. And then, then the range was crazy. Like, you'll get see as high as a 15, 16 play drive, and then obviously as short as one. So there's a yeah, range there. On average, it's six plays. 60 usually, to 70 plays is about the, the range on a, on a Friday yeah. night. If, if now I was, I've, I've coached with a high tempo team, so that's right where we're at. All right. So if you're a high tempo, six plays per drive on average, okay, you're going to snap the ball every, what, 30 seconds, 35 yep. seconds if you're fast. So there's your work to rest ratio right there with six reps and then get off and rest for five minutes. Yeah. Say we scored in six drives. That's a really good drive, man. We score in six plays. Yep. Boom, 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 boom. Big play. Boom. We're going to come over and rest. And hopefully the, we got a, we got a kickoff, right? We've got in between dead time. Our defense has got to get three and out and the shortest we're going back. So why are we so worried? Like, why in the world is the weight room not mirroring the same thing? And to me, that's where players get fed up with it because yeah. they see the difference. Like, coaches all in the weight room, like, we can't stop moving. We got to do this and all. I mean, it's not that it always needs to be directly specific either. Like, I'm not saying that. Like, if you're doing true conditioning training and you're trying to get your guys in shape, like, first off, if you're doing football-related stuff, that's conditioning is a whole other topic. Like. If you're needing to run at the end of practice, like, are you practicing hard? 
Yeah. That's another thing I'm wondering. It's like, why are you conditioning at the end of practice instead of using that time to just practice, you know, like high quality reps in practice. That's the specificity because you can run all you want. I hate to tell you this, but good luck. Like everybody's going to be gassed at halftime in your first game. Yeah. Cause there's nothing that can replicate it. And then by the time you get to week four, you're good. And you're hoping your hamstrings and everything held up. Yeah. That's why you sprint, right? So, like, you can't – you can only replicate the game so much. You can't replicate the game because it's three hours, four hours long, long breaks, extremely high outputs. You can't practice that every day. No. You can't prepare that way. illegal. (laughs) Right. No doubt. What's the next best way we can do it? Okay. To get those high outputs, the highest output exercise that exists is the fastest sprint you could possibly get. How do you get kids to want to sprint fast? You time them and create social pressure to compete. Here's your answer. It's common sense. It really is. But I think a lot of coaches get caught up in how they were brought up. Here, here's the most dangerous coach, in my opinion. The coach that thinks they, they don't have anywhere to learn. They won a bunch of games or were part of a championship program, right? And they don't have that much experience. Everybody knows that coach that came from, well, 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 back. Well, I, what, what we did at so-and-so, when we won championships, we did 300 burpees on Friday nights. Okay. You know, like that. Oh, yeah. And no, you, we, we all know that guy. Everyone listening it, is like, oh, that's so and so. And most coaches grow out of that at some point, but it's usually that coach that's been around the game three years or under. They played for a really good coach and they don't quite understand the concepts. They, you know, they've, they've been a JV coach for a year and they all of a sudden they think they can be a head coach. You know, like, <laughs> well, we, we all know those guys. All right. So. That was my fault. I got to solve on tangent. You did Monday and Tuesday. Monday was kind of, you said it, it can be upper. It can be a couple different things. Change of direction. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tuesday is your big explosion sprint day. Mm-hmm. What's Wednesday? Wednesday can be like a lift only. Cause like if you have a really high output day on Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe you don't do any field work. Maybe you just do another upper body lift. And then Thursday, go back to your power and output stuff and sprint again. Or you can do some type of competition, right? You like to make, make it competitive, but it all depends on the context of your schedule. Like we, for for example, we're Monday through Thursday. We're on the field first, 7 a.m. to 8 or 8.15. And then we're in the weight room from 8.30 to 9.30. So like we don't do, when I, in the summer, we do zero field work other than sprinting to keep our hamstrings and our power outputs high. And in the weight room, we do some, we do some turf sprinting, some acceleration work. All of our all of our lifting is based off of you know power and force capabilities and things of that nature. Like, but I, I also like because we practice first because of coaching schedules. We have coaches that work off campus that need to yep. get there before their work day. I mean, there's a lot of variables, right? So you have to make what works best for your situation. So it's hard for me to walk anybody through a true week. You know, the biggest thing yeah. is I don't want you putting like you shouldn't be doing 50 reps of an exercise four days in a row. You know, like, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. You should start with exercise selection. You should always start with your most demanding exercise, both technically. Okay. And output wise. And then as you work down, you start getting to the ones that you can do that are a lot more local, you know, more core, more local upper body things that are going to be less stressful, but you can do more reps of and recover from faster. Right. You can do, you know, body weight, uh, glute bridges. You can do core work. You can do, rowing exercises, maybe dumbbell pressing, stuff like that that you can do and not be debilitated from it. But if you're doing really, really heavy squatting at absurd amount of volumes, yeah, and that's a whole other conversation is picking loads, right? Like picking good loads in your, in your primary lifts. I think a lot of coaches, that's, that's step one, in my opinion, is trying to figure out how do I know what weight to put on the bar? For certain things. Now, I, like I said, I have tech. I have VBT. We are absolute snipers with this now. Yeah. And it, it's a no-brainer to me. But if you don't have tech, a lot of coaches get this ick that like, it don't look hard enough. That don't look, <laughs> that don't look heavy enough. Put on more weight. And you ask, why do you put on more weight? And the only answer is it didn't look heavy enough. Yeah. You know, rather than if you're going to max, because you did the, ask that question, how often should you max? Yeah. Right. Well, my biggest question is, how much do you value the max? Right? I, I like, don't, but other coaches that listen will. I, you know, I'm completely you know, out on maxing, to be honest with you. Well, I'm not. I think maxing is extremely valuable, yeah. but for certain reasons. Yeah. Maxing, not to tell you like a pass, fail, you're strong, you're not, who's the alpha. Like, no, like I need to assess where you're at. Yeah. And there's a cutoff point, you know, like, and to me, 
we we periodize or wave to where we when we get a little heavier, right? Our reps come down, and we get yeah. to the point where we're doing one rep that looks heavy. But now I have VBT where I can estimate everything, and I can pretty much know exactly where to go. Yeah, not a lot of coaches can have that, and you have to trust your eyes, or you use very intelligent percentages, right? Like my biggest thing, what well, my like if you're going to do a one rep max, what can can you? Can you repeat the the standard in which the assessment was given? I mean, that's that's number one when it comes to comparing data in the first place. Was were the tests you know the same, or is it, is it a reliable test? Yeah, like because mm-hmm. think about this. Think, let's use the back squat for example. We're going to max. What's the number one rule, or what's the primary rule coaches use? That all right, we're going to max, and in order for it to count, you got to what? Oh God, I don't want to do this. Past parallel, parallel. This day. yeah. Here's a parallel. Now that's not a bad term, but let's <laughs> understand where it came from. Parallel, okay, or hip crease is even with the knee, okay, ninety degrees. That came from simply a rule in the sport of powerlifting. In order for that contest to be like, you got to have rules in sports. Yeah, powerlifting is a sport. So in order for it to – that's where that came from. And I why it got adopted to football, I don't know, or non, non-sport non athlete. Because if you lift heavy enough, like it's not like if you don't – if you go to 87 degrees, you're not getting a stimulus, right? Or you're you're cheating. Yeah. Cheating, cheating. What Now, at the same time, though, more range of motion means more stimulus to the body. But your kids are not shaped the same. Understand that. Like, for example, like you would not – ask your athlete to do something they can't do like for example you've got maybe you've got an, an an interior offensive lineman who's pretty who's stout and short can get low and get under somebody and they're perfectly built for squatting right yeah i have i have the velocity based training uh product called vitruve and the vitruve unit has a string on the bar and it'll actually tell you the, like how far the bar traveled like for example we've got a we got a defensive lineman his name's bryson who, when you watch him squat, is just ATG, man. It's hamstrings on calves. You're like, that's low. That's what I'm talking about. And he stands up, okay? And then we've got a 6'5 lineman, right, who's built like Gumby, okay? He's got shorts. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a short torso, and he's got tibias and, and femurs really long. So he has to leverage the bar a little bit different. Yeah. And it, he can – to get his thighs parallel to the ground is difficult. But if you go back and look at the readouts of how far the bar traveled, my taller athlete moved it 26 inches and my short guy moved it 20. Yeah. Even though his joints moved further. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want my big guy to bend better. Everybody wants their big guys to bend. Of course. I hear that from coaches all the time. We've got to be able to bend. Right. But if you put such heavy weight on a kid that they're just surviving, right, they're just going to search for range of motion however they can. And if you force them to go low – and their technique's not great, and the and the work the load is heavier than that system can handle. Yeah. The body's going to try to find range any way it can. So instead of it finding range in their hips and their knees, they're going to find it in their low back. I don't necessarily want to trade a high squat for low back pain all year. Yeah, like a high mm-hmm. high high poundage squat. Like for what to get on the, the thousand pound club? Okay, yep. so like I don't treat all my guys the same when it comes to squatting because they're all built different. But they all know their individual standard. Now, if they drop below that standard, then yeah, we got to talk. Like, because kids are naturally going to do that. But if you don't value something too much, if you don't only put all your eggs in the basket of just a squat and that's the holy grail, right? Do you also value a broad jump? That doesn't cost any money. Get a tape measure and jump, right? Does you can get chalk in a wall to do a vertical jump, right? That's not that hard. You can actually do the math. If you guys want to want to be able to track power, do this. Find a way to get a vertical measured one way or the other. You can do a standing reach test, see how high their reach is, and then have them jump on a wall with chalk or a piece of tape and then measure it. Okay, so now you've got their vertical in inches. Okay. If you multiply, all right, if you could take the square root of their vertical in inches, okay, multiply that by the square root of their body weight in pounds, that's called the Swanson Power Index. And you're going to get a 0 to 100 normative score of how powerful somebody is in comparison to their body mass. 
at the college level, we considered guys really powerful if they were 80 or above. At the high school level, it's 70. Let's do an example. All right, I'm going to pull out my calculator. You already got your phone out. Do this. I'm going to do this math with you. Yeah, there we go. All right, we're going to do two different guys. We're going to do a skill guy and a big boy. Okay, let's do a skill kid. Let's say this kid's 175 pounds. Okay. Yeah, coach. Let's here. Let's do me. I was 175 pounds a senior in high school, and I'm curious now. How high was your vert? 32. Cool. All right, let's do the math. All right, so square root. I'm going to find out how big of one, pussy I was, Matt. <laughs> square root of 175. No, I think you know now just everyone else is finding out. <laughs> All right, so that's 13.2, right? That's 13.2, so everybody can hear it as well. All right, your vertical is 32. Yep. Like you said, square root of 32 is 5.65. So 5.65 times 13.2 is 74.5. You were considered powerful. Good. Yeah, in my relatively powerful. All right, so let's Every, take a big boy. That right? played with me is like bullshit. He played corner. He couldn't tackle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say you were skillful. I correct. I said you, you were powerful. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference, right? No, That's a no, whole you're right. conversation about skill acquisition, motor learning. Mitch, I feel like to you're going to end up being on the podcast like for 10 episodes now. Well, that's where, to me, that's where strength conditioning is heading, especially yeah. at the higher levels of where I'm trying to go is blending strength conditioning and physiological properties into <laughs> vi- like all the things that I look at in film of why are we not making plays? Yeah. Why are we not anticipating? Why are we not getting leverage? Why aren't we making tackles? Why aren't we seeing? Why aren't we perceiving things? The, you know, like all yeah. vision, it, that's the next level stuff of development. But let's, I digress. No, right, you're so good. 70, 74 was your number. Good, great. All right, let's take a, let's take a big boy. Let's take a lineman. Let's say you have a 285 pound guard. Okay, he had a big old boy. 285 pound guard. Let's say he jumps 24 inches. Okay, is this how you incentivize your big boys? 285, square root of that, 16.8. Square root of 24 is 4.89. What was my first number? I forgot. 284. Right? 285. Two, square root. 16.8. Sorry. 16. 16.8. Yeah. Times 4.89. That's 82.3. Yeah. Because he moved 285 pounds of mass against gravity. Yeah. Right. That much. That takes more force. Even though his vertical is 24 inches, where some people think that's not that high, and, and from absolute terms against the skill guys, yes. But let's put it on let's put it on terms where, of physics of moving your mass. Yeah. Okay, so that's called the power index, right? For all of you coaches that understand physics, if you under if you, if you've heard of Tony Holler and you've heard no of Trump coach stick, understands physics, come on, but you can explain. <laughs> yeah, you do. It to you us. play football. <laughs> Low man wins always, right? No. The no, leverage man the wins. wins. <laughs> Lowest center of gravity wins. <laughs> hey, no, no, we're there. Okay, that's it, that's center it. of gravity. Gravity is physics. Okay, yes, you know physics. You just don't know. So, all right, so that was power index. Okay, another great metric I like is momentum. All right, or what Tony Holler calls his truck stick. You're familiar? Yeah. Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. explained it to Mo- us, actually. Yeah, so the, the momentum formula is P equals MV. P is momentum. Why? I don't know. That's what physics says. <laughs> Somebody smarter than me, right? Mass times velocity. Okay. So if you take your mass and you have to use the metric system, so mass in kilograms times velocity in meters per second. And if you just use the Google machine, you can find it and you can, you can easily, you know, formulate things over. It's not hard to convert it. Right. And then you get literally like up to a thousand, you get a metric of how hard it is to stop you in a collision going fast. Pretty cool metric, right? You want to see how hard somebody can hit full speed. You know, barring your skills are there. Yeah. There you go. Now, so I, that's another cool metric. I think if you're listening to your coach, it's fascinating. We do not do a good enough job of giving cool measurements to linemen in the off season. When yes. Stuff. Yes. We put other so than, much value how, how other, than, other than how much they squat and bench. Right. And I but agree it, with but, you guys. There's sorry, Matt, I, I'm going to let you go in one second. No, keep going. We had an O lineman that we did flying tens with that got up to 19 miles per hour. It's he moving. was cruising. He, he how, was, how much does he weigh? I don't know how big he's. he's was he two seventy five plus? Jalen, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, like we have a, we have a right not. tackle who could run. <laughs> see, I have a right tackle who. Well, I had GPS on him yeah. during the year on a on a, a a now screen, like a quick screen, or no, 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 tunnel screen. 
tunnel screen, he's playing tackle. Yeah. He's two eighty five and got up to twenty. Yeah, it's on crazy. a screenplay. Now, in this, I mean, he's a division one. He's he's a. He's and a you're talking about player. in a game. This was on the track, so it was perfect conditions. Yeah. But and it was such a big thing that I wanted to celebrate in front of other people. Um, and people were like, "Coach, it's 19. I'm like, "Yeah, you can kiss his butt because he's 300 and something pounds running 19." I was like, "Your butt's 175, and you're having to struggle barely breaking 20." I was like, "I don't want to hear anything from you. Go sit in the corner." Hey, can so, I put a hundred pound weight vest on you and see if you can run one mile slower than what yeah. you run fast? You know, you can. shot. You put a hundred pound <laughs> weight vest on me right now. I'm gonna die out in the backyard. <laughs> But Kyle, Cody said it earlier, you know, where do you invest? What What's important to you as a program? And usually with the linemen, you're going to focus on squats and bench press, right? That's where the focus is. So that's what those kids celebrate. They're not yeah. there to celebrate the speed unless you're tracking, timing it. And, and you it. know, as well as I know, they're the most important people on the field. Look, I'm a defensive no guy. About I it. love the guys, all that. But your O and D line will win more championships for you than anybody else in the field. And I'll say that right now. And I don't care mm-hmm. if anyone wants to argue, I'll take you on on Twitter right now. The O and D line yep. championships. Fact, man. You win in trenches, man. Skill skill may you know, skills may pay the bills or create the hype, but you win championships in the trenches, man. And that's that's where our team last year made our money. I mean, yeah. we were really good up front. I mean, we had a running back who was electric now. I mean, he ran for close to three thousand yards and you fifty touchdowns. To. And but wasn't he, but electric. he runs for a lot more yards when no one touches him in the backfield. <laughs> yeah, you're not making contact until it was just a perfect storm. You know, like yeah. we had a really great group of kids, and we had a really good, really good group up front, both defensively and offensively. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree. So, try to find ways to to motivate all of your kids in the weight yeah. room. Like, can you find something that dangles that carrot to incentivize performance? So that's to me. That's the thing to me is like. I don't want to just go in there and blindly – because kids are not going to blindly co- trust coaches anymore. There's too much information no. readily available to them on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. They're going to question you. Like it's not back in the day where like you didn't have any resources and you had to just blindly trust, right? Yeah. And sometimes that can really backfire towards you. So how, how do you create buy-in? By telling them the truth and completely always having your why ready to go yeah. and why it applies, right? And it, then try to create the rules. Yeah, and then try to create the environment that cultivates that. It, I, would, I just keep using the phrase incentivizes performance. Yeah, like I agree. It's, there is a pressure gradient to do well, and that's a culture thing, right? Like you do things, you're you're drawn, like because most kids, you have like ten percent of your really charismatic kids, right, that can lead the room. You got ten percent of kids that are never going to care anyway. They're just happy to be there. They're hamburger eaters. They want to wear a jersey on Friday night, and they're cool. Eighty <laughs> percent are malleable. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? Right. That's, that's how I usually, I mean, it's just a typical bell curve. I mean, that's usually how it works. And if you happen to get that 10% of guys that are high character and, and your best players and your hardest workers, you got a chance to win. Oh yeah. That's the way it always works. It's no doubt. Coach, I, I, this stuff is fascinating. I, as a guy who always, you know, me and Matt and then me and coach Avery and some other people that, you know, probably listen, that I've talked to, we were always on the search you know, we still talk about it. We, we say, all right, perfect season. How do you lay out your full perfect season, right? And that starts with tr- strength, conditioning, nutrition. I mean, we got down to the finite of like, do you think we could find enough parents to cook them chicken and rice where when they left every day in the summer, they would have that if we were at a school where, you know, the kids were a little less fortunate. And we talk about this nonstop. We literally kind of play a game. We're like, all right, you got 20 minutes. Here you go. Perfect season. Go. And and none of it is like on the field stuff, right? It's always off the field, what we do in the off season, how we do this and how we do that. And I I love every bit of this. This is just, I, I, because I don't know enough about it. I guess that's why I'm so curious. And I've taken more notes in yours than I have in anyone else that's come on our podcast, to be honest with you. And that's not an insult to anyone else. That's just, I'm curious about this because I know the least amount about it. I've been very lucky, Kyle, Matt, like I really have. I've been around some unbelievable coaches. I've seen some extremely high level, you know, done it at extremely high level, some great minds I've been able to run circles with. And I stand on the shoulders of giants, man. Like all the knowledge I had was because somebody else was willing to pour into me. And I firmly believe like if you're a football coach, you don't have to be some CSCS strength and conditioning coach with a biology or physiology degree or some exercise science degree. To, to be good at this, like you don't, like a lot of coaches are really good by trade. There's way too much information on YouTube, Instagram, articles, websites, books written, good coaches. If you just seek it out, if you ask any coach, like who, 
what strength coach do you know that's knowledgeable? Can I talk to them? Yeah. And you're willing to learn these concepts. You can start piecing those things together, right? And then you can start going, okay, now I understand concepts. I understand principles, just like you do for your sport and, and tactical prep, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're prepping strategy because it's so funny, man. Like football coaches in the weight room that aren't involved with coaching on the floor, I always catch them on the whiteboard drawing up place. Every single one of them, every single one of them. That's what they're doing, but that's what they're passionate about. They're like, how do I beat this front? How do I beat, you know, how do I yeah. beat three by one? How do I beat two by two? How do I beat by, you know, if I get out leveraged here, what, what's our answer with the players we have? You can do that same thing in the weight room. And I've all, I've seen it happen everywhere. Like really good football staffs have one of their position guys where their main, their main role is strength condition coordinator. You know, and that's what they do, you yeah. know, and that's and they don't have to worry about much else because that's such a big part of the program. Or they're very fortunate to have a full time strength coach, you know, like I am like I don't coach a sport, never have. That's awesome. I've always just been involved with training athletes and being fully involved in trying to bridge that gap. And now I'm on a mission, man. I'm I'm literally on a mission. That's why I post so much on social media, Twitter, Instagram you know, have the products that I have because I just want to help coaches because I, it, it it really hurts me to see kids who are just getting destroyed and, 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 and not getting fully serviced. I think like, the kids deserve better, man. Like yeah. I, I still don't understand why superintendents, principals, ADs in high schools, they will not put a history certified teacher in a math classroom, but they will put any Johnny walking whoever yeah. in the weight room. That's why I tell my kids too. I'm like, look, you don't pay attention in math class, you make a bad grade. You don't pay attention in the weight room, you can end up in the ER. Yeah. Or worse. Mm -hmm. right? Or worse. So why would we put individuals that are not competent? And having a certification doesn't make you competent. You do realize that there's negligent doctors, negligent oh, yeah. lawyers, and they all <laughs> pass their certification. They all suck too. Like just because they have a certification and all it takes is for – administrators and people to see like, like, I don't understand if you have, you know, if you have a degree in exercise science, kinesiology somewhere, and then you have a certified body such as CSCS, that's the NSCA, SCCC, collegiate certificate, collegiate strength conditioning certification, which is even more rigorous. And now any coach out there can go to the NHSSCA.us, National High School Strength Conditioning Coaches Association. Okay. Join. Please join. It's been around since 2016. It is built for you, the high school coach who's trying to make it their way. If you join the association, go to nhssca.us. You can join. It's a hundred dollars a year. Like, come on. Like, you can get. You can find a way to get that paid for. Find your state clinic. Find your state clinic. Come to a regional clinic. Come to the national. Come to the national conference where we give you tools to specifically help. And the, guess what? We, they, the, the newly released certification, the HSSCC, High School Strength Coach Certified. Yeah. Well, literally, it's literally an immersive learning experience. It's not like one of those like, all right, we're going to test you, pass, fail. No, no, you walk through it and you learn all of these things. That's another one. And it's not even, it's, 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 it's less than, I'm pretty sure it's less than $400. It's not even that expensive that if you're going to run a weight room to me is mandatory for you to go through because it will literally introduce you to the concepts and arm you to be able to make really good decisions. So look into it, please. If you, if you're a, if you're a weight room coordinator, I highly, highly advise that you look into that and get that done. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I agree with you hundred percent in this state, especially look me and Matt, obviously we do this for coaches nationwide, but in the state of Florida, there's a problem with funding. There's a problem with just getting enough coaches, but it's the same thing. Like, I can't believe that if a good strength, you know, or a good weight room coach went to their head coach or something was like, look for $500, which most programs can scratch together if they really want to. Like you said, I can go get certified and all this stuff or something like that. Was it 500, you know, basically all yeah. in? hundred <clears> percent. I guarantee $500 would do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like you could and have resources. You're all, now you're introduced to a network of coaches that if you have an individual issue, you can call. That's the biggest thing with what I have now. I mean, that's why you have like, you know, the, the American football coaches association, yeah. those big conventions and you've got networks of coaches and stuff like, like guys, there's a lot of full-time high school strength coaches 
that are unbelievably good. There's also a lot of strength coaches at the high school level that were once football coaches before. If you don't follow Mark Hoover on Twitter, you're yeah. you're really missing out. Mark Hoover is a former <laughs> he's a former high school head football coach turned performance coach who was that guy that did everything wrong, super meathead, super just, you know, selfish. And now he's one of the best performance coaches in the country and can can literally tell you stories of years and, and help you solve problems because he's been in a lot of different types of schools. Um, so there's yeah, resources Matt, out there, guys. Matt, the only thing wrong with Hoover is I think he tweeted something about the Gators one time. So I'll, I'll kind of reserve judgment <laughs> for that later. But uh, He is I'm moving just... to Gainesville, though. That's what he was asking <laughs> yeah, about. He's, he, he's going right? to he's, he's gonna become a Gator. Yeah, I so. almost tweeted Uh-oh. at him, maybe don't move to Hogtown, move to a real place in the state of Florida. But I was like, <laughs> I, don't, I, was like I don't Hogtown. think he knows me, and he may take this super offensively, so I'm not going to do it. Um, completely joking. Not really. No one should ever live in Gainesville. Um <laughs> Coach, so I got a couple more questions, and Matt, you may have a few too. So first off, we've talked about it. I know what it is, but just for people out there, and you can give us the short version, what is VBT? Okay, VBT stands for Velocity-Based Training. And what it does, there's a piece of technology that attaches to your barbell, whether that be, there's there's really three different types, okay? There's camera-based, which is the most expensive one, okay? There's tether-based, where it actually comes out of a piece of unit and it, it Velcros to your bar out of the way. So it, it Or yeah. um, an accelerometer or a wireless IMU that kind of looks like a GPS unit, little chip that goes around the bar. And it measures how fast the bar or how slow the bar is moving. And if you understand, there's a relationship between load lifted and speed, the speed of the bar. Yeah. The heavier, the slower. The lighter, the faster. And what it does is it simply arms you with more information to make more informed decisions to make sure that you're actually putting the right weight on the bar. And here's the power of it. If you just use percentages, which is about what a large majority of coaches use, they max, right? Let's say you max at 405, yeah. 405 squat. Okay. And we're going to train off percentages. Okay. Based off of things like Prilipin's chart. You know, there's a lot of different research resources out there of how many reps at what percentage to drive what, Right. But the thing that the thing about high school kids, especially, is that just because they hit that 405 at that one moment in time doesn't mean they're they could always hit it. Yep. Right. Or they're always that fresh or they're always, you know, they could be psychologically domed up because their girl in the hallway just broke up with them. Yep. They could be psychologically fired up because the pretty girl looked at them longer than than usual and they're ready to roll. So what VBT does. okay, And a lot of people get confused with VBT as like just moving something fast. That's not true. Like what it does is it actually helps dial in even when you're lifting heavy. Yeah. Like for example, it's very valuable in my weight room because I know that because of what the, the the readouts are giving me, I can always get to the right weight in that moment of time. And at the same time, there's feedback of how fa- it's the same thing with the sprinting. Yep. There's feedback of because at the end of the day, we're trying to develop power. Power is force times velocity. I want to move as the heaviest weight the fastest possible. That's going to be your most powerful person. Okay. So if you can move heavyweight fast, how do I know I'm moving it fast? Okay. Now I have feedback and now I'm going to try to move it faster. Ooh, I can move it faster. And you unlock more potential. So you get the feedback. And at the same time, you can dial in, okay, if I know my athletes giving me my high efforts, but the speeds aren't there, maybe the fatigue is there. We need to back off and get to the zone that we want to be. Um, I've got it pretty dialed in. I have a system that's really dialed in and simple now. I yeah. spent a lot of time with Dave Ballou at the University of Alabama, who is the VBT Savant. And yeah. uh, he taught me quite a bit. And we've now been running with it for almost two years, completely outfitted and good from there. Now, don't think that VBT is a philosophy. Yeah, It's not a philosophy. It's not a method. It's information. Just like I put it to you this way. I go, all right, you upload your – you literally upload your film to Huddle. Now, if you had – the only information you had from week one to week two is that you won or you lost. That's it. You only get the scoreboard. Huddle says it's an image, still image of the scoreboard. You go to the next week. That's all you have. You either won or you didn't. Yeah. How would you know? If I, like, no, you don't. That's not enough information. I want to know how I won. I want to know how I lost because I may have won, but there were some really bad reps in there that we want to fix. About the bad habits. We may yeah. have lost, but maybe we played a really superior team, but we did some really good things we need to make sure we hit on. There's a lot of different things to unpack. Details. Instead of just weight lifted, 
did you get it or not? It's how did you lift it? Yeah. That's the information you're getting. And then you can make, it's just informed decisions. A really valuable reason for a VBT for me is our middle schoolers. It keeps them from lifting a weight that they're not prepared for. For example, I put a cap that you're not allowed to move a weight slower than 0.65 meters per second. You have to be perfect technique and the weight has to be light enough that you can move it that fast because I want it to be light enough to develop skills. And we don't want to go any slower than that for the first yeah. year or so in our program. So it actually is something that puts a governor on kids that, you know, eighth grade boys just want to load up heavy and see who's the strongest. And mm -hmm. now I don't have any reason to max. Now with a VBT, I can max anything I want. Like, for example, when speaking to Dave Ballou, he says peak power is the name of the game. Peak power, as far as meters per second, and we're talking about the average speed from the time the bar starts from starts on the way up or the concentric range of motion from the time it goes up to the time it stops. What's the average speed? Okay. The velocity that it's traveling. So he told me it's between 0 0.80 and 0 0.90 meters per second. That's your, that's your holy grail. That's like the perfect mix between weight and speed. Now we compete on that. How heavy can you go and not go below 0 0.80? That's a yeah. max. Can you PR in that? Because that's what matters to me is power. Right. Here's another framework to look at. I'm going to give you two more things. If you, when it comes to how strong you are, right, you can produce force too slow and it not be applicable to the field. Dave also talked about that on, uh, on the field of play, like if you actually do a stopwatch from the time the ball snaps to when pads hit, 400 milliseconds, 0.4 yeah. seconds. So you only have 400 milliseconds to produce force. Right, you got to beat the guy to the spot with more force. As long as you beat the guy, beat the guy to contact with more force, you can win. Right, but like for example, on a really heavy slow squat, if all you can do is lift a lot of heavy weight, but it take you a while to get there, I make the analogy like it's like it's like bringing the prettiest girl to the party that's already over. Like, what's the point? Like, it's too late. Like, <laughs> it's it's not it's not you didn't get there. Okay, it's yeah. over. Party's over. Um, so. Like for, I've got a couple of good examples here. Like we had a kid who was kind of a muscle bound kid. He transferred in. He's always been strong, had a heavy squat. But when we did like a power assessment on him, he couldn't even get the bar 2.90. I couldn't, I couldn't make it light enough. He, could, he did not have the power up. He couldn't do it. Strong, stiff, and slow. Yeah. Right. Doesn't play. But he's a weight room warrior. He can, he can heavy squat. Now that's an extreme example. Right. And so and the way we actually philosophize, like the, our philosophy and our programming now is that we only train heavy as long as power continues to go up. Yeah. Right. I don't just train heavy to keep getting heavy up. We train heavy to get powerful. Heavy is a stimulus. Heavy is important. You need to lift heavy. That's not a, that's not the point. Like can't go without lifting heavy. There's actually this weird trend too, of doing all this functional exercises and never lifting heavy too. Like that's wrong too. <laughs> like, trust me, you've got yeah, to that's, apply that's stimulus. Tom you need Brady. to get strong. Yeah, that's find he's a, like Tom Brady. He's a Scientologist too. I don't trust him. Um, is he? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. Oh man, uh, we, don't, we don't want to talk about that too much. They'll try to sue the podcast. <laughs> so okay. Anyway, all right. So here's a great example. So you remember that tackle I told you it ran 20 miles an hour? Yeah. All right. So in my VBT journey, I wanted to know this. I understood this. I understood that there was a direct correlation between uh, speed and load. Everybody knows that. Heavier, yeah. slower, lighter, faster. Well, when I started getting like VBT charts of, okay, these speeds correlate with these percentages. Because all I knew was percentages at that time. Like what what would 80% look like on a, on a speed? Because I know what 80% looks like to my eyes. Okay, because I know 80% is a good load to build strength. All right. So you can reverse engineer, right, speeds and loads for the most part if it's a perfect straight line. Like, for example, if... If you think that you lift 400 pounds at a max, 50% of that is 200, okay? And you're, your 50% is always going to be 200. Well, that's not – what I learned in this journey was that it's not a linear example, and let me tell you why. Okay, the tackle I was telling you, he is an offensive lineman who's going to play power five football, but his bench press max is 290. Impressive or no? I would say no for a lineman, but – yeah, I would too. Right. Yeah. I would definitely say, yeah, he's not, he's not strong coach. He's not strong coach. <laughs> okay. What does strong mean? All right. So let's do the math. Okay. So 
I was using VBT at the time. So his one rep max, and we used a velocity threshold. So let's say 0. 0.30 meters per second was like our, remember how I was telling you 0.90 or higher? Yeah. Like you can only go to 0. 0.30, which to me on a high schooler, you have to be a really good lifter to move something really heavy and really slow and stay in it without getting stable. Right. So yeah. 0. 0.30 is our standard. All right. 290. Now, 0. 0.90, the one that, the or 0. 0.80 to 0. 0.90, on a percentage conversion was around 52%, okay, of his max, if it was a linear relationship. So peak power should happen around 52% of 290, right? So 52% of 290 is 150 pounds. That's yeah. what he should be able to move a bench press, 150 pounds at between 0.80 and 0.90. Guys, he can move 205 at 0.80, yeah. 0.90. But he could only max 290. Which one do you think is more applicable to the field? Oh, it's going to be the one where you, it's going to be the lower one or, or however you it's say it. It's the power, not yeah. necessarily the heavy one rep max. Heavy is just a stimulus that needs to help kids get powerful. Accumulated heavy reps is how you get myofibular hypertrophy. Okay, I just threw out this really big word. Holy okay. Shit. All right. Let's talk about it. Here, here, I'll, make, I'll make it make sense because does mass matter in football? Yeah. Yes. Like, dang right. It, dang right. It does. Yeah. You need your kids to get bigger. I need uh, to anyone add. who's running to a pulling guard knows that. All right. <laughs> I, need <to> add, <laughs> I, I need to add mass. Some kids you're like, man, I need, you talk about weight all the time. I wish this kid was 10 pounds heavier. Yeah. Right. I wish this kid was 15 pounds heavier. It just, he'd have a little more mass. That's important. A lot of like, all right, why do we lift weights? To get bigger. Yeah. Right. That's the, that's the whole point. So what's the process of building muscle? That's that fancy word I used hypertrophy or it's spelled like hypertrophy like that's what mm -hmm. it's spelled like oh yeah now i know that word if you pronounce it hypertrophy now i realize i was saying it wrong right. the whole time. hypertrophy <laughs> hyper who cares it, you can say it either way but that's the process of building muscle right you're trying to get bigger all right yeah so if you're trying to get strong strength is an output right it's it's a magnitude it's ability to do a lot of force one time you you develop that by by lifting heavy because yeah. there's this neural component of this signaling okay the motor unit has to signal the muscle to contract boom right you think about those paddles bam like this big electronic charge force but it's limited by the contractile size of your muscles you ever seen a guy that's like didn't look all that strong but when he lifted weights you're like good god he's strong but he didn't oh, look yeah. big it's because his nervous system was extremely powerful you ever had a guy that really looked the part looked like but then he got under the bar and was like, dang, he ain't near as strong as I thought he looked. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. He's got <laughs> he, he's got strong looking body, but maybe the contractile elements aren't actually all that powerful. Like the signal's yeah. not strong enough. Okay. So myofibular versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Big words. Okay. You ever heard of like guys getting a pump in? You do a lot of reps and you feel your muscle swell up? Yeah. All right. So in the muscle cell, okay, well, in the yeah, in the cell. You've got sarc sarcoplasma is like the plasma. It's the, it's the liquid, right? And bodybuilders, that's what they mostly train really high reps, like 12 to 15, exhaust the crap out of the muscle, and it gets bigger by adding more fluid. But there's no, you're not actually increasing the muscle fibers inside of the muscle belly because that's the contractile elements that create force. All bodybuilders are all show, no go. Their sport is to look, not perform anything. Yeah. Right. So they look big, but they don't have to perform anything. We have to perform. We want to be strong. Right. So like in order to develop contractile elements, you need what's called mechanical tension. And you got to put tension on the system. Heavy, aka heavy. All right. Well, if you add heavy on top of more volume, which is total reps, right, that's where your strength, that's where your size is going to come from. And it'll be good size, not yeah. the kind that washes off in the shower. That's the pump. Right. So if you want to get your actual muscles to get bigger, you need to accumulate a lot of heavy reps, but do it intelligently because too much can fry the system. Yeah. That's why I'm a huge believer in a lot more sets, less reps. Like if you look into a guy by the name of Jake Tura, T-U-U-R-A, he has a program called Hypertrophy Clusters. And it's a simple concept of lifting for trying to get a total amount of reps, right? So he says your progression is 8 by 5, 10 by 4, 12 by 3. So think about it. If I have eight sets of five, okay, that's 40 reps, right? 40 yeah. reps. Can you lift more weight doing a set of five? Or if I did four sets of 10, also 40 reps. If I did 10, 10 reps or five reps, which, which one can five. I do more weight yeah. with? 
I'm still getting the same amount of reps. But now yeah. if you accumulate the tonnage, right, the amount of total weight lifted in that 40 reps, it's a completely different ball game. So now you're getting strength and size at the same time. Yeah. No, that, I'm, I'm, saying. Mean, I'm shocked that you were able to make sense of that in my tiny mind. But uh, well, no, that's the whole point perfect. is to make it simple. If I if I no, can't make I it at a third third grade reading level or lower, I don't know it that well. No, that's right? a great point. So so like five four three, everybody knows that five is like a decent decently heavy weight. Four and go a little bit heavier. Three and go a little bit heavier. Yeah, right. And then I go from forty reps, ten sets of four, forty reps, and then go to twelve sets of three, thirty six reps. I bring down the volume a little bit. Now that's that'll absolutely wax your ass if you're not if you're not careful. Like like. That takes oh, an yeah. advanced level. That's like junior, senior level type of approach. Yeah. Right. You might not have the ability, the skill level to lift that heavy for that many reps as a freshman or sophomore. Might not. And then you have your outliers here and there that are. So I went on a big tangent there, but I was just saying like, that's valuable information to understand yeah. of putting on mass, right. In a way that you can still lift heavy and get strong rather than doing a lot of coaches you see doing like three sets of 10 of everything. Yeah. Why, why, why are you, why is it, why, are you, why is there three sets of 10 on everything on the board? Where would you get like from? day one, three sets of 10, <laughs> three sets of 10 on the board. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, even I, number, I remember you know? it. I, I've, I've probably written it. I'm not going to lie. Um, right. That's always like hey, week one, day one, three sets of 10 all the way down. And then you slowly work to five sets of five or some, some crap like that. And I, I, right? I'm with you. I, I have no idea why I was writing stuff up on the board. Most and of the time me, it wasn't because I was a track guy, thank God. But when they were like, oh, okay, sure, go do the weight room workout. I'm like, I don't know. Well, that goes back to our first conversation about what do you do in week one? Like if you do three sets of 10 in week one, you also have to consider like soreness comes from accumulated time under tension. Yeah. It, it takes a time under tension for like that type of muscle response or a lot of soreness is going to be between 20 and 40 seconds. It's going to take you between 20 and 40 seconds to do 10 reps. Yeah. Right. Now, and then, like, if you're in season, that's a wholly different thing. Like, I'm trying to hold on to strength but not tax my system, Yeah. right? I want to keep my volume low, so my reps low, so I don't accumulate soreness. But I want to keep my my, elect, my electronic, my neural system firing with power. So I need to stimulate it with a heavy rep here and there, right, to make sure I'm still popping, yeah. but not enough to fry my system. Like, just fire it up one good time. Rev the engine. Mm, but I'm not going to run out of gas by yeah. revving the engine. <laughs> I'm going to run around the gas by doing a ton of mileage. Correct. This is great, Coach. Coach, I love it. Let's um, let's do this. I know we've been going for a little bit here. I'm good, man. We're getting into summer. Um, so what I want to do is we talked a little bit about summer here, but is there any way we can bring you back here in a couple months and talk to you right before the season starts? Do you have some time to pop back on and talk about that with us? Yeah, and go over in season training, like yeah. camp, yes. all that stuff. Yeah, that would be so great. Yeah, I'd love what to we'll do is we're going to try to time it up. Right now, we're timing it up. Hopefully, perfect for coaches going into summer. I want to bring you back and let's talk about in season training. Maybe like late July or something like that. We'll we'll get with you on sure. schedule and let's talk about in season training because I, I, coach, I'm fascinated by this stuff. I don't know enough about it, so I want to learn more, even though I'm nowhere near it. Matt, sure. did you have any other closing questions? He answered like everything I've asked. So. <laughs> No, I think it was all fantastic, and I, I mean, there's things to go further into, but I, I think that would be great for the um, next one. Coach, one thing real quick. Can you guide our listeners to where they can find the resources you're, you're yeah. providing them already? Yeah, for sure. Um, I yap a lot on social media, so come follow me. Uh, I am the same handle on X and on Instagram at CLH underscore strength. Uh, you can go to my website, clhstrength.com, where I have some, like like Kyle said, I have yeah. my entire 2022 football offseason on there. Uh, you can download for free. I've got a, believe it or not, I have a Maximize the Power Clean ebook on there for free for anybody that needs to learn how to teach it. If you love it that much, I, I know how to teach it. So <laughs> go get that. Um, I have a book that talks about program design. That's completely free. Literally, High School Coach's Guide to Program Design. That's like 80 pages long. Um, you can look at it there. It gives you a, a, a pretty much a system you can use. Those are mine. And I've got some paid products on there too, like a programming manual, the programming toolkit that's on there that will, that literally has a manual to teach you sets and reps specifically and what they mean, how to progress week to week. Like that's why I said picking loads and that, it has nothing to do with tech either. Like a way to do it that you don't have any tech. You can buy that whole bundle. I have had 36 preset sets and reps that you can run right now for 12 weeks and it's ready for you. Um, those are just my, 
uh, resources I have there. And then also the, if you want the absolute immersive experience, the Cultivate Mentorship, Online Strength Conditioning Mentorship is for any coach that wants to learn the principles that you can literally walk away from 10 weeks and be armed with every uh, piece of equipment, you know, in your brain is right, kind of how I analogize, right? I got, I got every piece in the arsenal up here now, and it's used as a reference point to look back at, to if, say, hey, you're the weight room coordinator for our program, and you could walk away from that, and you could train anybody at, at a decent level, and you'd probably be better than 90% of coaches out there. I really believe it. Now, a lot of other resources out there, if you want to look at more articles, for, for if you want to just look for, like, where do I find articles for strength conditioning in the first place? Go to simplyfaster.com. Yeah, okay. I love S- that website. I am PL is simply with an I, S I M P L I, faster.com. It's probably the most read strength conditioning article yeah. log out there. And there's everything from speed training, plyometrics, weightlifting, football. I mean, the literally the world's best strength coaches all write articles for those guys, including, including I, I've wrote, written a few articles for yeah. Simply Faster as well. It was where so, I found Tony Holler. It's where I found Feed the Cats. That's it. So, yep. Yeah, so great. Those are great resources. Those are what I would put out, including mine as well. Love it, coach. Yeah. Awesome. So again, and we'll put that up, you know, we'll put links up for that. And obviously we'll tag you coach on all of our clips on Twitter. Cause I think we're going to have a lot of clips from this. Uh, we'll put, yeah, I'm on Instagram too. Same, same handle. So I see you guys are posting on Instagram as well. So and we tag me there as well. I'm, I'm so. getting better at it. We we're even on TikTok. Uh, we do that <laughs> apparently. Um, I think we're off of shadow ban finally, Matt. So that's, that's Woo-hoo. pretty exciting. So for a while there, like ever, all of our views dropped to zero for no reason. We we're like, what the hell's going on? Right. Um, but we're back up now. Our views are back up to like five or six. Um, so <laughs> perfect. Well, coach, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this was truly a pleasure. We can't wait to have you back on again. If you're out there and you want more information, visit coach DM coach, talk to him. He's, he's fantastic. Um, again, I always talk about it. Like, look, I just saw him tweet and I was like, I got to reach out to this guy and ask him to come on. So coach, thanks so much for joining us. I think this was great. We can't have, uh, can't wait to have you back. Yeah. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you, coach.